I wanted to uh, start out with a couple of thoughts. Well, typically, as a scientist, what we do is we think about our research and we say, oh, we got this great idea and we get it all planned out and, and we find the funding to do it and we go do it and we write it all up and we publish it and then we go tell everybody about it. But we're going to do it a little different. In, in what we're undertaking here, it's a, it's a huge undertaking. And what we want to do, we're kind of starting, even though it's been for some of us three or four years, we want to engage you at this point so that you can be a part of this process and provide input and understand what we're doing and you can help push this thing forward. And that, that's our whole thought with doing this symposium at this point in time. Rather than waiting till we have lots of data and lots of thoughts of our own, we want to engage you now so we can get your thoughts about hemp or switchgrass or crested wheatgrass or butanol versus mixed alcohols or whatever the thoughts might be because you guys are smart and you're out there seeing things and learning things, we want to hear back from you. So, so wanted to mention that to you at the outset. I'm going to be talking about developing sustainable biomass resources and I got to get my phone out of my pocket so I can look at the time because I'm going to have a really hard time getting done in 20 minutes. <laughs> but I'll try. And if I can make this thing, there we go. So just a little bit of background to kind of get us rolling along. Agriculture, as we all know, is a fundamental way of life, and it's an important part of our fabric in our region. It, historically, traditionally, on and on, you know, you know how all that works. Uh, it contributes to the economic base of the region, and, and we think that's important. And I think that it helps during these boom and bust cycles. It helps level that out a little bit. And we need to be looking at promoting long-term economic, social, and environmental prosperity in the region. I don't think anyone would, would say that's not important. And it would be nice to invigorate uh, the region for, with our traditional agrarian sector by creating new, new stuff, new technologies that are powerful and sustainable. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so why the interest in biomass and biofuels? Uh, we talked about sustainability. Uh, Morgan did very nicely. We want it in agriculture and society and in the environment and all those sorts of things. We want to cut off foreign oil sources as soon as we can. And we need to develop a domestic source of transportation or liquid fuels. <clears throat> so Mor Morgan talked a little bit about the types of, of biomass. I want to talk about that just a little bit. Woody biomass from forests and, and rangelands, that's possible. And I'll mention that a little later on. Um, crop residues, we've heard quite a bit about crop residues taking corn stover, that, that material that's left over after the corn is harvested for grain, wheat and barley straw. This is not a very good idea. We need to be putting that residue back in the soil to improve organic matter, to, to increase water infiltration for nutrient recycling, uh, improve soil structure, and on and on and on. <clears throat> so that's really not a very sustainable and a very wise approach. Uh, there are waste streams like wood chips. Uh, that is a possibility. I expect those would be fairly small and pretty intermittent. Uh, they could be plugged in, potentially. Urban waste from tree trimmings and construction debris and other sorts of things. Again, I think it's not a large um, uh, resource stream, but it might be plugged in. Uh, oils, oil seeds from, from oil seed crops like uh, sunflower and uh, Canola and flax and camelina, those are, those are potential sources and we are looking at those. Uh, in fact, this year uh, we're going to have a demonstration where we're going to take uh, vegetable oil. We call it SVO, straight vegetable oil. We cut it with RUG, um, regular unleaded gasoline, 20 to 30 percent. You can burn it straight into a diesel engine. It voids the warranty, but it's very, uh, <laughs> very, <laughs> that's because there's no national standard for it but it does void a warranty. Uh, they've been doing this in the Rocky Ford area for the last two or three years, and we're going to bring that technology over here, and I'm pretty excited about that. I'm not going to spend any time on that today, but if you're interested, we could talk about that later. Uh, I'm working with another group to, to undertake that uh, research endeavor. Uh, dedicated, dedicated energy crops, and, and as Morgan indicated, we're looking at perennial herbaceous grasses, and we call this lignocellulosic biomass, and I'm going to introduce this term to you in, in the next slide and tell you a little bit more about what it is. There's all kinds of grass species that we could look at, warm season and cool season. Uh, we've scratched our heads pretty hard and picked the ones that we think have the most potential for our region. So what is lignocellulosic uh, biomass? 
Well, cellulose is the most abundant organic compound in the biosphere. Most abundant organic compound in the biosphere. It's all these little sugars, glucose, that is hooked together in a linear chain that forms cellulose. And then we have hemicellulose, and it's a polymer of different sugars that are five or six carbon sugars. And then we have lignin that is the glue that holds all this together that makes the framework for the house of the plant that holds it up. And what we're going to do is we're going to deconstruct the house by taking this stuff apart and then putting it back together into liquid transportation fuels. Sounds easy, not easy when you have to break these things apart that have chemical bonds that are, that are made for structural purposes. <clears throat> Now this is messy slide. I don't expect you to <laughs> understand it. I certainly don't. But this is all of the different pathways that one could take to create energy from biomass. And, and there's a lot of sorting out to be done by people that are smarter than me in this area. Uh, metabolic engineers and chemical engineers, uh, organic chemists, inorganic chemists, to, to sort out which is the best way to go. I don't think that's hard and fast. We have decided that, whoop, wrong button. Here, here's lignocellulose, and we're going to hydrolyze it, turn it into sugars, we're going to ferment it into alcohols, and we're going to push it down here to, to this butanol. Now that's the pathway we've decided that we're going to go. But there's lots of other potential things out here. And there's a lot of work being done in the United States on a lot of these different areas. It's it's just amazing, it's exciting, and I hope it keeps going forward. Because there's a lot of chemistry that's got to be sorted out to determine which is the most efficient, which is the most e practical, and on and on and on. I don't think that's been determined at this point in time. Uh, one thing that I find quite interesting, and I sat on a review panel for some large grants at USDA back in Washington, and there was a group that was proposing taking uh, biomass and turning it into a type of bio-crude, where you would ship it and put it through a cracker refinery just like we have currently. So that would allow us to have the same kind of infrastructure but just produce it in a different fashion, which is kind of cool. So there's a lot of interesting things going on and we're, we're a part of that, we, we, we think. Okay, potential uh, biomass production, and Morgan did a great job of talking about this. Here's some of my figures that, that I have. Uh, 130 acres of, of cultivated cropland in the rifle area, uh, agricultural land in the rifle areas of 1.8 million acres. There, there is opportunities out there, we think. You'll have to help us decide if, if these numbers are real and help us refine these numbers. We, we envision that herbaceous perennial biomass will be grown in the, the mountain valleys and, and meadows of western Colorado. Again, how much will this cost and what is the cost to farm this land for biomass. These are some of the things that uh, Catherine Keskey is going to help us sort out as we go along and collect data. Uh, there's a lot to be learned and, and there's a lot of things we need to get answers to. What, what are the agronomic characteristics of an ideal bioenergy crop that makes it sustainable? <clears throat> and here's a list that I, well, Morgan and I have come up with this. We, we want high yields. Yield is important. The higher the yield and the lower the input costs, the more profit potential there is. Did I say that right, Catherine? Yeah. More or less? Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's the dark side of it. <laughs> <laughs> so we want high yields and we want low inputs. Uh, we want perennial growth. If you've got to plant it and cultivate it every year, your input costs are going to go up and it's just not going to work very good. We want little allocation of dry matter to reproduction, although having seed production so we can plant it is important. We want a long canopy duration. Uh, sterility would be nice to prevent moving places we don't want it to. We want a, a large high water use efficiency. We want a low moisture content at harvest. We don't want to have to haul a bunch of water around where we could just haul dry matter around. We want minimum plant to plant competition and maximum competition against weeds. And it's got to, it's got to be suited for agriculture. We got to have mechanical agriculture to be able to keep our labor costs down. And it needs to be resistant against uh, disease and pests. So that's some of the things that, that I see that we need to have in an ideal bioenergy crop. <clears throat> now when you, think about, when you think about a supply chain system for biomass to bioenergy, it's very complicated and it's complex. And I've just put a few things here. 
we have to, we have to develop the feedstock, and that means we've got to have plant breeders and geneticists and genetic engineers and metabolic engineers and all that sort of thing. And then we have to produce it, and that's my job. We've got to grow this stuff and grow it in an economically sustainable manner. Then we've got to move it. We've got to harvest it, and we've got to move it from one place to another. And, and that's not trivial. How do you go about moving it and storing it and securing it? We have to look at the whole system and, and look at it. How does it perform? How, how do we optimize the system? And, and then we have to convert it. We've got to convert it into something, and we've got to refine it and make it usable. We've got to figure out how to market it and get it out to the folks to get it in their vehicles. And we have to be concerned about health and safety. And like we're doing today, we have to educate people and tell them about it and explain this and that and the other so that they're well informed. I'm sure there are other things we could put in my list there. As Morgan indicated, that re the thing that really got us going was this uh, rather small but important grant that we got from the Colorado Department of Agriculture. And the title of that is Evaluation of Perennial Plant Species and Production Inputs for Sustainable Biomass and Bioenergy Production in Western Colorado. And it's a two-year grant, and we're into the second year. And so when that goes away, uh, we are in need of, of more funding to keep the thing going. And we've submitted two uh, larger grants to uh, other... Uh, other grant programs and we're waiting to hear back from them. <clears throat> now our research goal, and I've got a, I've got a fairly lengthy uh, wording up here, we want, we want it to be sustainable, we want high yield, we want low input, we want it to be environmentally enhancing, we, we don't want this stuff to compete with food crops to push the price of food and, and feed up, um, and we want it to be able so it can be converted into to biofuels, and we're targeting, as we've indicated already, butanol and, and mixed alcohols. Butanol is considered a second generation biofuel, ethanol is a first generation biofuel, and, and ethanol is okay, but we got to transition from ethanol to, to a second generation biofuel because of what Morgan indicated earlier in his presentation. Here's our research objectives, and I have five. We're going to evaluate grasses and legume species, mo mostly grasses, as single and mixed species, species plantings and production input levels to identify those that are really productive and targeted for biomass. We want to show that efficient and economical technology exists to convert and process biomass into biofuels and assess potential of co- and or byproducts like we talked about using the leftovers to turn into pellets for a, f a, a feed application for cattle. Research objective number three, assess carbon and nutrient cycling, carbon budgeting, and carbon sequestration. Based on the literature that we've reviewed, there is a very, very good potential that this kind of a system will actually sequester carbon. It'll take carbon out of the air, decrease the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the air, and put it into the soil, and build soil nutrients, uh, and, and be a long-term sustainable approach. Uh, we're also going to look at uh, four production uh, input levels, and I'll mention that in another slide in a little bit more. Um, we're going to perform economic, energy, and life cycle analyses of these treatment variables to help us identify a sustainable biomass production system for the region. And then, as we're doing today, we want to conduct a lot of outreach, public education, and technology transfer regarding biomass crop production and biomass conversion to biofuels in, in the region. We, we think this endeavor of engaging you at this point in time is, is very important and can be very powerful. <clears throat> so for the research approach that we're doing uh, in the field, <clears throat> we have these four grass and grass legume mixtures. That's our factor one in a, in a uh, scientific experiment. And four input levels, that's factor two. And these will be evaluated uh, in a five-year testing program. It could go longer. Uh, I, I wouldn't want it to go shorter. And we're really getting underway uh, this year, although I have, I have a little bit of data from last year, and I can, I'll show that to you briefly. These are the grass mixtures that, that we've chosen, and, and we didn't choose these lightly. 